Welcome to the ICANN webinar. We are talking this week about understanding autism. My name is Sam. I have with me Caitlin and Kyle. Question number one, how did you feel when you were told about your diagnosis? Uh, okay, I'm gonna go first. I felt good and bad. I felt mostly good because I thought I was autistic for like two years and I told my parents and everybody um, heaps and everyone was like, you're not autistic. <laughs> And then I went to a psychologist who was a um, specialist. She was specialized in women, autistic women. And she was like, you're autistic. And then she was like, the more I talk to you, the more I think you're autistic. Um, and then I got a diagnosis. And then, um, so I felt good. I felt like a huge wave of relief because I thought that I'd been um, clinging on to diagnoses um, for ages. Um, and I spoke to my dad about it and I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know if this is right or not. And he was like, well, just sit with it for a while and see how it goes and see how you feel. And like, try the strategies that come with the diagnosis, like come with the, try out the support that is offered with this diagnosis and see how you respond to it. And I responded um, very well. And so um, I felt relief. I feel like relief was the biggest thing. I was diagnosed when I was 21, 21. And I'd struggled heaps for like, significantly for like a couple of years trying to cope with uni and trying to be a um, adult. Um, so yeah, for me, it was relief, but I imagine it would be probably different for um, different being diagnosed younger. Caitlin? Um, well, I don't actually remember being told, Hey, Caitlin, you have autism. I've kind of like blocked it out. Um, but my mum certainly remembers. Um, <laughs> which wasn't a, it wasn't a good reaction. Um, but I was about 15 when I was diagnosed. So I was in year, I was in year nine. Um, I could have been 14. Maybe I was, 15, uh, who cares? 14, 15. Um, and my mom told me that I just had one of the most intense meltdowns that she's ever seen. I was just screaming and carrying on. Um, and I do remember kind of like being, having an attitude of, oh, not another thing, not another diagnosis, not another label. Because prior to that, I'd already been diagnosed with a whole lot of stuff. Um, and I, I found it, I found it really disempowering because at that point in my life, I really just wanted to be normal. I didn't want to be different. I felt like an outsider. And it was just another thing to make me feel like I wasn't a part of, you know, my community in some sort of way. So, I, yeah, it was a pretty um, overwhelming and intense experience. And I only really, I only really remember being like, oh, I have autism when I was in year 11 and I was doing, ve I was doing vet at, Bandura, um, I mean, not vet, doing, doing a VCAL course at Bandura Secondary um, College. And we watched a documentary about Temple Grandin. Mm. And I was like, oh, my mum said I have this thing. This is when I realised that I have all, this is all I remember. And I was like, oh my God. Like, she's so like different to like, to, like me, but like, I just connected with her. And, and I just felt like, oh, I had like an aha moment. Um, Incredible. But I still wasn't happy about it. But I was like, oh, my God, there's this chick who like lays down with cows. And so <laughs> like, just thought, it just made me feel like, oh, yeah, we have this thing. But then, yeah. Maybe I can innovate the abattoir industry. <laughs> yeah exactly because at that point i was like a militant vegetarian so it was like it was just like yes um but i guess also um with the di like you sam i got diagnosed by a, a lady who specializes in females on the spectrum um in which there's not a whole lot of research around girls and women and autism and so um yeah, she really, I went to her later on in life and she really explained to me the differences and um, kind of went through my diagnosis and why I have autism because I definitely, up until probably a couple of years ago, I went through some 
moments of being in denial because I'm like, but everyone tells me that I'm so normal. How can I have autism? So, yeah, I didn't, it took me a while to really understand what autism is and how it is a spectrum and, you know, yeah. So, yeah, my little spiel. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, you diagnosed when you were like 14 or 15. And did you uh, have other, did you have other diagnoses before? Yeah, so, um, well, I was diagnosed with ADHD when I was three or four. How, how, how did you feel about that diagnosis? Like, do you feel like there was, a, did you perceive them differently? Or were they both just like something that is not, something that isn't like- It was just something that was always there. I, my my mum never hid it from me and mm. she never framed it in a way of, um, this is bad, but she did frame it in a way like, okay, you have this thing and therefore some things are a bit harder for you and explained it that way. But I interpreted that as being, oh, there's this thing that's like makes me crap at stuff. So I didn't, because I was very literal in my interpretation. My mum probably didn't get un understand at that point how literal I took things. I, I, I didn't like it. But then I do remember having moments of being like someone, I remember being in primary school and someone making a joke saying, oh, he has ADHD. And then I was like, oh, no, I have it too. And being, like, I remember being little and saying that to someone. So I had moments of being like, yeah, it's cool. But then overall, I, I didn't like it. Yeah. And then I had diagnosed with dyslexia and auditory processing disorder and then mental health problems as well. So it was just like another label across my name. So yeah, overall, not a positive experience, but it's fine. Yeah. Um, what about you, Kyle? So <clears throat> thanks guys. I think I have the exact same story as you guys. Um, I was diagnosed with a lady who specialized in Asperger's. So back when, back when that was still a thing, so, hey, but, um, so in my, my small country town, there wasn't a lot of understanding of what autism was and especially autistic subgroups. So my initial round of diagnoses came back with just ADHD. Well, ADD, it was ADD at the time. And, um, so I was pumped full of medication and she'll be right, mate. He'll grow out of it. And that was really the opinion that was taken until I was 14, 15. Hey, it must be around those transitional ages. And I was a miserable train wreck. And so my mum took me back. And this is when she went, we went to the specialist and the specialist said, one, getting off the meds, two, um, that it was, I actually had Asperger's instead. So, and dual diagnosed with dyslexia. So he wasn't struggling in school because he was hyperactive. He was struggling because he couldn't read. And so my autism diagnosis came and my Asperger's diagnosis came with a whole bunch of relief. But at the same time, it was sort of like, I'm still not normal. Like, why can't I just be normal? Maybe if I work hard enough, maybe if I, you know, eat all my vegetables and try hard enough, I'll still grow out of it. So for a long time there, there was still quite a fair bit of conflict in learning to be okay with the fact that I was autistic, Asperger's, whatever, and I'd be okay with that. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was a journey from, yeah. yeah. To, to get where I am now definitely didn't happen overnight. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a huge journey. Cause there's, yeah, it's like, you don't just feel one thing you have to, there's so many different emotions because on one side, it's like, you feel like this might explain stuff and this might help you do cope better in the world. And there's the other side that's like, you don't want to be shunned by society for being different. Um, and you like, you know, you're scared about that, but then you're also maybe excited and like curious and um, with all of these and to actually say how do i feel it's like oh i feel hundreds of things about it <laughs> and our understanding of and i hate labeling autistics as disabled but our understanding of different neurotypes in the early 2000s where i where i lived and as as a country as a whole was so far behind where it needed to be so i was you sort of like you're growing up with all these inherent biases and stigmas against yourself because yeah. it's like you know autism is a bad thing you know therefore if i have it i must be a bad person or somehow deficient yeah broken. And, you know that's something that needs to be fixed 
Yeah, and it's and it's the attitude towards our neurotype which is disabling. Like it's not it's not being autistic itself that is necessarily disabling. Disabling. It's the way that society doesn't accommodate for our differences that causes a disability. Um, I feel. That was deep. <laughs> okay. Uh, any final thoughts? How do you feel when you talk about this? No, let's go to the next one because these questions just get more and more juicy. <laughs> what does your autism look like for you? What comes easy to you and what doesn't? So this is a huge question and this is something that I think about often. And since my diagnosis, I feel like I spend a lot of time thinking about it um, because I go through heaps of periods of being like, oh, maybe I'm not autistic. Um, maybe I just have some quirks. Maybe I'm just like eccentric. Um, and, but then, and then, and then there's some things that happen. That I'm like, oh, this is pretty, maybe I, this is pretty autistic. I feel pretty autistic right now. Um, I feel like I have a very strong sense of like, um, <laughs> this is what I wrote down. Like, they're like, it's all connected, man. Like, <laughs> and like seeing everything like seeing everything as in relation to each other and being like really aware of how everything can connects to each other. And if something doesn't seem to connect to the bigger picture to like the rest of the big, bad world, not the big, bad world, big, cool world. Um, then it's, then, then, then that's distressing. It's like, well, how does this fit in? If I have this big construct of how the universe and the world all gets like glued to and how all the different parts work. And once you know the structure, then, everything just fits in quite neatly. And sometimes it's hard to find where something fits in neatly. So once you figure it out, it's like, oh, and it's great. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it feels like for me. <laughs> um, and things like when I read books about like science, some science things, okay, what comes easy to me is sometimes like getting really complicated concepts if I'm in the right frame of mind, if I'm like, you know, if my, like, if my mental health is good, then I can like read um, hectic science books and be like, oh, this is so easy. This all makes so much sense. And I can like, remember all these weird facts, remember all these weird, like strings of information, just because it's like, oh, like cobalt is used in like, um, lots of batteries because something to do with it being blue. And it's in like the belt of I was reading about this the other day, all about cobalt on Wikipedia. There's a belt of cobalt that sits across the earth. Um, it's pretty. About? It's pretty important. It's an element. It's oh. one, of the, one of the elements. So oh. cobalt, lithium, and one other are basically the building blocks of technology. If you don't have them, yeah, like the whole world, so our modern society just falls apart. It's why Australia is so geographically important because we have massive reserves of it. Mm. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, what stuff doesn't come easy to me is like I spend lots of time trying to figure out what other people do and what other people like spend their time doing and thinking about and stuff because because um, it seems like people waste lots of time not doing anything that's particularly connected to anything else. Um, and I, um, feel like I struggle to relate to friends and stuff sometimes when we're hanging out and it's like, we're not doing anything, we're just hanging out. Where does, where does the stuff, where does, when does the stuff happen? When does the learning happen? <laughs> when are you guys going to start telling me cool facts or ask me about like, um, chemical, like properties of chemicals or like, I don't know, cool things. Uh, and when do I get the chance to tell you about all the theories I've been learning about in psychology, that kind of stuff. You can't just bring it up in a short conversation. Um, that's, that's like, I feel like, uh, that's like, uh, the overarching thing, but then there's heaps of, there's just like heaps and heaps of stuff all the time where I'm like, Oh, this is easy or this is hard. And then I'm like, is it because I'm autistic or is it because of just like genetics or is it just because of who I am as a person and my life and my experiences? Um, so it's hard to tease apart, but I feel like the overarching thing is the, like, it's all connected, man, mentality. <laughs> uh, thoughts, Caitlin? Oh, 
Well, well I definitely agree with especially the last part you're talking about, like relating to people. <laughs> um, yeah, if it was up to me, I'd just talk about what I want to talk about all the time. But unfortunately, some of my friends want to talk about the Kardashians instead of, um, you know, what a waste. Bernie Sanders, for example. <laughs> so it's, it's like. <laughs> Why do um, you want to talk about the American election, though? It's so interesting. I actually have one friend. He will. He won't watch this. Um, Patron. Um, and he's obsessed, like me, with the U.S. elections as well. So I have like one buddy that yeah. like I can relate to in that field, and I previously didn't. So it was kind of really hard. But um, to get back on point. Um. So what does, what does your autism, autism look like for you? I think overall in my, in my life and even now, I feel like my autism in a way has been quite isolating. I feel like um, a big part of having autism is your interests and things you're really passionate about. Um, and my interests from a very young age were quite um different to other girls um like when i was in year five i became religiously obsessed with hitler and then like in a, in a in a normal way um but i was a success and i didn't really realize how different my interests were until mm -hmm. i was like 13 14 when i became obsessed with the levison inquiry and if you guys are the levison inquiry but it was an inquiry into the murdoch papers Oh, in, um, that sounds awesome. In England, and, and I just, every single day, ABC News, they would be, do what, um, like, um, televising the trials and stuff, and I'd take notes, and I'd be like, it was so consuming. That was me. That was my hobby, was things like that. And I was like, I remember going to school and, like, talking to people about it, and they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and so then I feel like that's a very autistic autistic um very common it's not it's not unique to me it's very common in a lot of autistic um people and I find that that part of my autism growing up was quite restricting and isolating because I didn't really have anyone to share that stuff with other than my mother because my mum is interested in a lot of the things that I am mm. um but yeah and I think you know, the other part of my autism that I do, and it's still not negative because I do love my interests, um, but my, you know, my memory, I have a really good sense of memory, um, which again is not unique to autism. I feel like that's a trait. Is that a trait that every autistic person has in one way or another, they have a good memory? Uh, don't memory for specific things. Often it's related to our um, special interests. So, you know, it's why savantism is one of the diagnosis criteria. Where, like, I'm sick at remembering history, but shocking at everything else. Yeah. So, yeah. But it, 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 is, it is a thing, isn't it? That, like, yeah. everyone... Yeah, it's a way. thing. I think, I think as well, like, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, like, verbal, like, memory of facts or memory of things. It could be memory of, like, where everything is in the room, which yeah, is exactly. where people get really anxious if something's out of place in the room, because it's like, no, 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 my memory is really, really strong of the room being, like... Mm and you've just ruined my entire memory that I rely on heaps. Um, it's almost like semi-photographic memory, but not to the point where you can remember everything. Like, everything like that, it's just, it almost seems to be all of the annoying things. So like, mm. the way room layouts work, or the way when a teacher says something, then changes their mind, because they've changed, like, two or three words. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that. Or, like, the tone of someone's voice when they say something. Yeah, Why and it just plays on repeat. <laughs> Well, actually, um, the reason I bring it up was because when I went on my first ICANN camp, I had, I went in really kind of ignorant and I really didn't understand what autism was. And then I heard about like memory stuff and I was like, oh my God. And then I remembered like on the, it was in like some sort of, the, the place was in some sort of weird, like, I don't know, in the bushes in some rural, I don't know where it was. And anyway, uh, when my mum picked me up and took me home, I directed her home without using the GPS. And I realised that, like, because I went on this camp and was like, do I have autism? And I realised that, hey, I have this trait that I never even realised was kind of cool. So, um, you know, as I've gotten older, I've definitely realised 
more and more of how autism isn't like I thought autism was someone who was nonverbal and you know couldn't communicate and you know just sat in a room all day I didn't really which which isn't even necessarily it sounds bad but it's not even a bad thing that's there's, there's still people with talents and skills and um potential so you know I I really yeah so now I have a better understanding of what autism is but um yeah have I kind of answered the question I think it has. yeah what do you find what what if you had to describe your autism in like a sentence how would you describe Caitlin the autistic mm. Or like two or three sentences. Don't don't limit okay. yourself like sticking exactly to the word count, but I'd be like a highly individual, non following, weird interest and fun person. <laughs> Does that make oh. sense? <laughs> no, no. Like that's how I look at my autism. With some sensory problems. <laughs> Just a little sprinkle yeah. of sensory problems and, and I'm all good. Sorry. Like, the, the, basically, I think the autistic definition of autism is, hey, we're a nervous wreck, but we get superpowers, like memory and special interests in research. We're just, and very, uh, much, and we're very just, much, I mean, there are some autistic females that can be, a, follow the crowd a bit, but I feel like my, my autism has just made me really independent, naturally, in a lot of ways, and really um, not care so much about what people think so like you still think that you're really socially conscious though like even though you you go against the va the grain you still like yeah are I'm, very acutely aware of it i am i am aware of it but it's more yeah. natural now i mean like more so when i was little i there was this girl um one of my best friends she was the most popular girl in the in the year, in our year level and she was my closest friend and like when we had recess, all all of the there was a group of like ten of us. All of the girls would get up and follow her to the toilet, and I'd be like, and I'd just sit down, like could, that's how it was. So it's like, and I'd just sit down, and one of the chicks was like, oh, why didn't you come? And I was like, why do I need to go to the toilet? I'm gonna sit and look at, I'm gonna sit and do my own thing. So it's kind of that very like singular, not a sheep, you know, that kind of thing. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like on that on that note, um, I hear what you're saying, Caitlin. Like, uh, it's on that note of like, it's like for a lot of people, it seems like just intuitive. It's like it's like this weirdly intuitive thing to like perform all these social like rituals with your acquaintances and friends and classmates, mm -hmm. and it's like it seems quite intuitive to just like do this stuff and to like conform and people just like, yeah, like intuitively conform to a situation and will just like not really think about their actions or would not really think about like, not really think about like, does this, does this, does this behavior that I'm about to do, which conforms with the rest of the group match up with my values and like who I am as a person, my identity. And I feel like, I don't know. I, I feel like hyper conscious of that. And it's like, well, no, it doesn't. So I'm not going to go and do that thing. That thing looks um, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, but for everyone else, it's like, it's like, that's like this huge cognitive, there's this huge, like thinking through and processing all of this stuff. And then someone else is like, oh, like you're slow because you're not following everyone else to do the thing. It's like, no, no, I'm just like thinking really, really hard about it. Um, yeah. To the point where I decided that that's not in my best interests. In which I think, especially when you're younger, having that mentality kind of makes it harder to make friends as well, because yeah. you don't follow. In, 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 I'd had moments in school where I did follow. I was a highly, the reason why I get social norms and social cues in a lot of way is because A, I watched a lot of TV and B, because I would mimic um, I was highly, I'd, I'd observe my peers a lot and kind of mimic how they, you know, interacted with each other. And that made me more comfortable to be me. But at the same time, because you're really thinking so much and analysing and trying to be normal, it stops you from being your natural self and then stops you from making friends easier than other people. 
Yeah, and you stop developing your own sense of self. Like it stops you from actually working on your actual, like your self identity rather than like just projecting it onto like other people's identities and just like making it. Mm. Yeah, I think that, I think that um, I'm very interested to see kind of how uh, gender, gender perceptions come into autism diagnosis because like, I think as there's more like the like gender diversity stuff and then neurodiversity stuff is both like going through high schools and I'm interested to see, I feel like they both will kind of complement each other in terms of um, they're just being more like general acceptance for diversity and like difference. Um, I'm trying, I'm still trying to figure out, fully figure out and understand the differences between males and females. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, yes. I feel like the main the main thing is is just um, the social norms for males and females make the autism present differently. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. yeah, I feel like the way I a specialist have explained it to us, and I think this might be interesting to like ask you guys about, is that because girls like their social networks are more complex sooner than guys, so therefore. Female autistics, because they develop social consciousness sooner, are more socially capable. Like, even though they have that lag time that male autistics have, they get over it quicker. Therefore, they are able to mimic and be more, form these more socially complex structures and stuff like that. So, like, mm-hmm. female autistics are much more aware of where, where the box is and how to conform to it. Whereas oftentimes male autistics, while there is some that do get it, oftentimes struggle with that a hell of a lot more by the same time that's what makes it so much harder to diagnose because they don't often outwardly present with the uh, the traditional criteria of autism so you know highly anxious antisocial um severe savant syndrome um inability to um to project emotions on others or to empathize stuff like that Mm. yeah i feel like i feel like um women are socialized to be really empathetic and be really emotionally responsive to other people's needs. Um, and so growing up socialized female, I think I felt very much, I felt an expectation that I would be good at people skills and good at communication and, um, good at, um, yeah, like understanding, understanding what was going on. It's like that, like, you know, like one day you're going to be a mother and like, yeah. and so you've got to learn how to like take care of people and nurture people and stuff. But see, uh, say for me, I grew up having a really like ultra feminist mother. So mm. I didn't have a lot of that um, social norm. Like I was prohibited mm. from having Barbies. And oh, really? Yeah, wow. I never had one. <laughs> sad, makes me sad. But but I still got that from the schoolyard and I still got that from, you know, TV. Yeah. I definitely felt like the pressure to just behave in a certain way and be very calm. And at school, I was like calm and gentle and a little bit mean to my teachers. But at home, I was like, <laughs> I, let out, I let out all the rage because I had to like just conform to be this you know, perfect girl in which I wasn't, but mm. uh, interesting. Yeah, uh, I think, I think, do you, th- uh, yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I felt like there was something really good coming that it just didn't arrive. Yeah, that was so anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was waiting like, ooh, smart thing. <laughs> um, let's, let's see, let's see what I can, let's see what I can chunder up. Yeah, um, I, I think I think um, my mom had a pretty traditional as traditional views of gender roles. I'm pretty sure, um, and I don't think she gets the gender diversity thing um, very well yet. She's getting there, um, but I also think that I mean, there's just so much media. There's so much media everywhere that just perpetuates really um, binary stereotypes of what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Like, it's just so everywhere. You kind of can't avoid it at all. When you go shopping for clothes, 
when you listen to the radio, when you're watching TV, when you see ads, ads are so weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> watching like watching ads on like commercial TV is like, um, like, and, and they'll be like, oh, like, they like try, they like try, they like try. Anyway, I'm, I'm gonna go down a tangent. For dudes but, too, yeah. It, my it, point it, is, it. my point is that you internalize that stuff. Like whether you're not, even if you're not explicitly thinking about this stuff and being like, oh, they're using this such and such gender or, or, oh, the man always seems to do this thing and the woman always seems to do this thing in all the media that I watch all the time and in all the music that I listen to. Um, but you internalize it and it makes up who you are and who you want to be and who you don't want to be. Um, and I feel like autistics can be like hyper sensitive to that or like not or like completely the opposite. Very can, like reject it. Yeah. Um, and be like, this is all terrible this is all terrible why am i bothering like roll my eyes at all of this i don't want to engage in this but then there's also that side of like well i have all of the information so if i did want to fit in i have like all these instructions and i have all of this information like thousands and thousands of interactions and media examples and representation of what i should do and so all i have to do is do that and then i'll be accepted by society but you're not happy because you're not yourself <laughs> exactly yep uh yeah yeah what about you carl have we um, spoken to you about this well, question? Oh, no, but um, I've been I've been sitting here just going, yes, preach. Um, I've always been a bit of a square peg in a round hole. So, in fact, if you'd asked me ten years ago what it's really cold where I am, sorry guys. Um, if you'd asked me ten years ago what I thought my autism would look like, I would have told you I was dumb as a bag of rocks. Like I just had such a a negative, disabledist view on what. I, on who I was, like I just I just viewed myself as this this bumbling idiot, and um, I was in my first high school at the time and was really retracting from society even more. And like when I did talk to people, it always seemed to devolve into bursts of anger and why don't you just get me? <laughs> I was an angsty teenager, so yeah, for me it just I I, I would have described myself in very very negative terms. Whereas now I view autism as definitely something to be leveraged because like you guys have said, the ability to learn new information and use your hobby and interest, even as a lens to see other things. So it's amazing how like I'm, I'm a, I'm a history nerd on top of loving talking to people. Um, I'm, I'm a, I'm a total history nerd. So being able to see the world through that lens, people are so interesting and like, it's amazing what you can learn through that, through that, thing even like you know how the discovery of the elements or um how you know social structures lend themselves the how we have developed our understanding of um elections and things like that and how we what we consider to be a free society and stuff like that mm. it's um it's interesting how you learn these things but i had closed myself off to learning completely and that also met my my special interests so i would go to school every day and just be miserable and I was just a miserable person. So I find, I would answer this question by saying, what does autism look like to me now? It looks like learning. I, uh, mm. I, I, um, I um, sort of grumped and detentioned my way through school. So being able to like now as a 23 year old, sort of going back and learning stuff. And, you know, I always try to learn something new every day. So for me, autism is learning. And what do I find? What do I find easy? Now I'm older, I almost find it easier to talk to people and like communicate with people now because I almost don't care about social constructs. I'm just like, Hey, awesome human. Let us talk about the thing. And I've tried to surround myself with people that like are honest and genuine and we can talk about stuff. Most of my friends, we talk about, you know, history and politics and all that kind of stuff just because that's our, those, those are our interests. Yep. So like I try to make sure my network is enabling so, um, yeah, no, but autism for me has changed a lot in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, what do you think doesn't come easy to you now? Ooh, um, I still, as much as I love talking to people, I definitely struggle with people I don't know well. Mm. So, and that, that's also like a trust thing because of, of my schooling. And unfortunately, this is a side effect of that. Mm. I um, don't trust easy. And I'm, I'm, I'm very, very self 
like there's a lot of negative self-talk. Like, did I impress them? No, they hate me. No, you, you know, you're screwing this up right now. Dude, just pull the record and eject. Mm. Like, so for me, talking to new people, people I don't see very often is really, really hard just because I almost self-sabotage. So sort of recognizing that behavior and sort of moving past it is, is something I still struggle with, but I'm trying to get better. I, I, I can really relate to that um, idea of like really enjoying talking to people simultaneously, like really enjoying communicating with other people um, and finding it really like cool and magical and enchanting and stuff. But also that like every now and again, that like creeping, that creeping voice of like, what if, like, what if they think you're really weird or like what, like, uh, yeah, like all those like negative, all those kind of negative things can kind of come bubbling up and catch you off to the side and you have to really, one thing I think I've gotten good at is like telling that voice to like go away. It's like, no, I got this. I've thought of this. We've, we've, we've talked about this heaps of times and you're wrong voice in my head, negative voice. Like, in my head. like and I'll, I'll give you a present example. Like I always walk away from these things. Like I totally screwed that up. Like I really rooted that. And so like spending the next couple of days being like, no, actually you did contribute something worthwhile was <laughs> it's, it's just that little stuff. And it's, I think because of, unfortunately, the way we were all brought up around autism, it's um, definitely something you have to work through to challenge your own negative perceptions of yourself. And, you know, the way you view what you're contributing to, to the world, because it's so easy to fall back into that. Autism is a disability. You have nothing to contribute. Just stop talking now. Sort of, sort of mentality. It's easy to wrap yourself back up in that barbed wire because it's safe. Yeah. Yeah, and that, yeah, and like feeling like, oh, my, what I have to say, my opinion doesn't count because I'm too different, I'm too odd. And so my interests and my thoughts and opinions are um, too obscure. Therefore, like, they're not worth anything, which is totally um, not true. It's totally not true. Um, and you're a boss, Kyle. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think... What comes easy? It's kind of, I mean, yeah, it's like what comes easy for, to you and what it doesn't come easy is like, it's similar to the like, how do you feel thing? Like there's so much stuff kind of packed in and like autism, I see my, I see my autism as like just who I am as a person. I don't think I could disentangle it. Um, I don't think I could disentangle it from my being. Um, when, do you guys when, think it's one of the defining features of who you are? Like, does it define a lot of who you think you are? In hindsight, yes. When I was younger, it would have been fighting against it, trying my hardest to be the most, you know, round round ball to go in that round hole as humanly possible and trying to, like, squish all these bad, all I viewed as bad habits and traits just into a dark little part in the back of my mind and ignoring them. But mm. now I think it's almost the exact opposite where I'm defined by how I can be autistic and still positively contribute. And autism is just so, it's also so different for everyone. When I'm really going, when work's really going, I'm seeing something like a hundred different autistics a week. And every single one of them is so different and how they view autism is so different. So mm. like just sort of being there to poke them in the right direction, I think is such a, such a good thing because autistics have so much to contribute to the world. They yeah. just need to, you know, love themselves a little let a little more. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think I uh, see my autism as like background noise, as like the background noise of my life. Like it's always, if I have like a quiet moment to myself, then like the little habits and the little kind of thoughts and like activities that I do to like when I'm bored or whatever, those are the, that I see kind of all of that as like the background noise of my autism kind of coming to a head. Like I do a thing where if I'm in... Um, <laughs> I said, I said, I said, like, if I have some free time in a new room, then I'll spend some time like looking at all the PowerPoints and lights and stuff and trying to imagine where the power, where the ele electrical cords would go. Um, it's not just me. <laughs> 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 it's really satisfying. And, and, and after doing it for quite a lot, I'm like, oh, I can predict where the switchboard will likely be um, just from like being in the room. Cause, like, well, probably going to be over there because I don't know. Yeah, and I and I and I and I, uh, and I get a lot of satisfaction from that. I derive and I can spend a lot of my time thinking about that. Um, but then if someone's like, um, "I'm talking to you, and we're at a cafe, and you're like doing this," 
<laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, it's because whatever you were saying is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> Did that answer your question, Caitlin? And what about yourself? Yeah, it did. Sweet. All right. Uh, before before we move on, hey yeah. Caitlin, do you how does you do you think your autism defines you, and uh, in what way? Mm, I think maybe because of my workplace, <laughs> it makes me feel like it defines a lot of who I am because I talk about autism so much mm. all the time. But I feel like kind of like Sam it's a bit of background noise it's it's almost like when I wake up like I mean I don't like I just don't think I'm autism like do you know what I like I'm autistic yeah. I don't I don't have that kind of thinking like some people do but it's just kind of like, like waking up and be like ah <laughs> stay on the spectrum <laughs> <laughs> but no, the weird thing I is have, that I do have a lot of moments throughout the yep. week where I just do something and I'm like autism <laughs> I'm just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah but here's the thing when we're in an entire room of autistics as well we are the neurotypicals like we are the we are the dominant normal neurotype in that room so you know in our world we are normal because we spend most of our lives around other autistics. And when we are around like neurotypicals, it's like, Hey, let's, let's, let's meet in the middle and discourse. So mm -hmm. are we, you know, are we really neurodivergent within our world? Hmm. That's a big debate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've had a debate like that with my sister a lot. But yeah. 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 If I think, if I think about all how, if I think about like the neurotype, the idea of neurotypes where everyone's a different neurotype, is there a neurotypical? Like, is anyone neurotypical or is everyone just a different neurotype? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, it's, I was looking, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm such a nerd. I was looking at population densities the other day and there really is no such thing as a normal human. Like how mm. we define it is so, such a big sweeping statement because when you break everyone down, especially when you're like trying to convince people to vote for you and stuff like that, like, there's all these sweeping statements and stuff around normal because no one is normal. There's no such thing as like the atypical human. We're all, we're all weird and we all fit into different diverse subgroups and categories. Definitely. Everyone's got some weird, everyone has every single person on the world has some weird thing that they're like, Oh, this is, this, this is a weird thing that I have. And every single person has that. And the people that don't have that, are exceptionally oh, yeah. weird. <laughs> um, there's a theory. There's a theory. Uh, it's kind of a theory. Um, it's called the theory of. Uh, it's like normative and non-normative experiences, and it's yep. just the idea that every single person, every single person across their lifespan, will have some experience that are go against the grain of what society expects. Like every single person has something that is non-normative um, that goes on, and that is, I feel like being on the spectrum is like one of those things. And maybe that's like one of the only things, um, maybe in every other kind of aspect of your life, everything else is like fairly normative, relative, like relatively. Um, uh, yeah, no, I like that point. I, th I, I like that point, Kyle, of like everyone's got differences and ours is just one that's, that's weird at it's the moment next, it's just next level it's just next yeah. level you know humans 1.5 we are we are we are the next version <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah you know we've spent 48 minutes in order to go through two questions <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I was like the same thing okay but you know, like this is gonna be a six seminar, but this is gonna be like a three hour seminar. <laughs> gotta answer each of these questions in we've got one, two, three, four, three more questions. We've got uh We're uh, not doing this in twelve minutes. One minute. <laughs> Sorry folks. We are not if you're what if Stacy didn't cut this part out, we are not doing this in twelve minutes. Have a little minutes. have a small break, go make yourself a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> Come back and we'll continue. <laughs> All right. Uh, what does it, oh. How did you start becoming more comfortable talking about autism and your support requirements? Mm. Uh, I can network, probably literally just I can network. I still feel pretty uncomfortable talking about autism and my support requirements. Um, in my general day to day life, pretty much all the time. Um, if there's other autistic 
people and I'll talk to them about it. Um, if I am feeling... I don't really, I don't necessarily talk about my autism, but I am good at being like, I am uh, like said, uh, oh, 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 maybe, uh, hmm. <laughs> Caitlin, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Not the, that was the smoothest handball ever. <laughs> okay, I can go. Okay. I'm, I'm like Sam. Um, I didn't start becoming comfortable about talking about autism until I got involved with the I Can Network. Um, but I remember the first time I ever spoke to my peers about autism, and that was in year 12. And my dean of senior school had been on the I Can camp that I had been on. Um, she was just there. And anyway, I was in class and she came in and she's like, Kaylin, you gotta tell everyone about the camp you went on. You gotta tell everyone you went about the camp you went on. And I was like, oh. and then she was like, she was like, oh yeah, it was an autism camp. <laughs> and so, and so, so did you just get did you just get outed by yeah, your teacher? I did. She's a good oh. person. It just happened. Anyway, um, I was like, I remember this guy was like, what autism? You have autism? And he's like, he said, I thought autism was when you can't talk. And I was like, so did I. I literally <laughs> said that, and so did I. And so I think that was like a forced moment where I basically told my whole entire class that I'd known for all these years that I have autism. <sighs> but like, it was a massive icebreaker of mm. like starting to become confident about the fact that I had autism. And actually no one cared. Um, I think maybe we were like all 17, 18, we were older now. And I explained mm. what it is um, to the class and stuff. And um, yeah, no one really gave a damn, which was pretty That's cool. nice. Um, and yeah, ever since then, I'm 23 now. So ever since then, the more I, I mean, my job, one of, my job is to sit and like talk to other people who have autism. And so when you do that all the time, you obviously become more and more comfortable and confident and understand autism and your own autism. So if it wasn't for the ICANN network, I don't see myself like batting an eyelid when I tell someone that I'm mm. autism. Like I, I just, like I don't go up to people and say, hi, I'm Caitlin and I have autism. What do you have? But it's just like, if it comes up in conversation, I'm like, yeah, I have autism. Um, that would be a sick icebreaker. But like, yeah, like, hey, do you know how many times I've said that to someone and they've been like, are you sure? Are you sure? You don't look really? like it. I remember I had a conversation. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> I, remember, I remember I had a conversation with this oh, guy yeah. who's doing his bachelor's in psychology and he was talking to me, he just started talking about, he's in context, started talking to me about his cousin who had autism. And I was like, well, I actually have autism and blah, 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 blah. He's like, really? And then I had to explain to a psychology student of what the spectrum is and like how oh, it's not yuck. a one dimensional thing. Yuck. And that happens to me probably a dozen times a year. I have someone say to me, cause I have a lot of conversations with people about many different things and it does come up, but mm. people just don't understand what it is. And that becomes frustrating after a while, so. Mm. Yeah. Um, Kyle, did you find uh, did you find pre I can network being comfortable talking about autism? It sort of happened slowly. So um, I'll, I'll <laughs> the first nine years of my schooling were a living hell, and I'll and you know I I, I yeah it was a thing, and it's become quite a defining thing. So when I moved to my second high school. I had a lot of issues and one of them that I've actually figured out was that I didn't know how to function in a school cohort that didn't want to terrorize me yeah. and like trigger me for fun or, you know, um, I just, I couldn't cope in a, in a, in a loving, caring environment. I just didn't know how to do it. And so one day I was, I was in year 12 and my, me and my form had sort of a, had been going through a pretty rocky phase where they were just like, what is wrong with this guy? 
And so the, the subject came up with PTSD because one of the psych kids was studying it at the time. And they turned around and said, hey, Kyle, that sort of sounds like you. Like, what's, what's the go here, dude? Um, and so I sort of explained to them, hey, I'm dyslexic. That's why I struggle with school. I'm also autistic. And when I was a lot younger, it was a lot easier to tell I was autistic. So my classmates would used to, you know, terrorize me to the point of, of, of you know, tears. And they all went, oh, that makes so much sense. And it started, or it started opening up this really awesome conversation about, you know, words and what we put out there. We need to be in control of what we say as well as, you know, being, being aware that, that, you know, the weird angry kid got there like that for a reason. Mm. So I slowly sort of warmed up to my autism by talking about it and sort of being, being hey, you know, be careful what you say that person re will remember it, even though you don't remember what you're putting out, other people are. And then, yeah, I started working for ICANN. And so, and my initial cohort of mentees without, without getting super specific were um, all very similar to me in that regard. They were having a really tough time with institutional, with being in a, in a traditional school environment and um, sort of learning to move past bullying and moving past all that stuff. So, to sort of talk to them and be like, hey, it's okay, you're going to be okay. It's okay to feel uncomfortable at passes. Was a, went a long way to helping me get to that yeah. point where I could be like comfortable again and be okay in my own skin. Yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, self-disclosure and being able to like own it, being able to own it and like being in a position where you are, you kind of have the, uh, you, you don't just have, you don't just know that you're autistic, but you also kind of have some words to describe your experience. I think I struggle talking about it so much because I don't know how to explain it that well. Um, and so it's like, well, if I, if I say I'm autistic and then someone's like, well, what does that mean? And then I'm like, um, I don't know. I just like see things differently or something. And then people are like, well, so does everyone. And then I'm like, okay. Um, but, but being able to identify, identify things to bring up um, and, and having practice talking about it and being able to relate to other people as well. And having other people say like, do you have some, someone's like, Oh, that sounds a bit like you or like, you have that vibe or like, you know, people being able to share experiences. Um, uh, I feel like a good way for that is to kind of think about some really strange trait you have and then just share that. And people are like, Oh yeah. Like I, one thing I always do, I happened not long ago. I was talking to a guy who's quite a bit older than me and he, and I just said to him, you know, I'm not looking at you in the eyes. And he said, what? I've known you all these years. And I said, I've never looked anyone in the eyes. I look at people's mouths. I can't look people in the eyes. And he was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that is a bit different. And I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. just think about a little weird little trait you have and just <laughs> say that and people, people get it. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, Not that it's weird. No, it's, it, yeah. you know. It's all, it's all terms of reference, but it's always funny to find the most zany th or even like, it's amazing what people pick up. So you'll be, you know, you, you're cruising along th thinking you're doing your best masky best. And then people are like, Hey, did you know you do this thing? And it's really weird. And I'm like, Oh, I do. And it's like, yeah, but it's sort of endearing. It's sort of cool. Like, don't stop being you dude. But yeah. it's, it's sort of nice to, yeah. It's like, uh, it's like a foible. Um, it's like a yeah. lovable, a lovable characteristic. Yeah. Um, apparently one of my foibles is I do Ted talks, um, constantly at parties and stuff. People yeah. be like having a conversation and I'll like duck my head and I'll be like, Oh, sorry. I couldn't help it here, but you guys are talking about this theory. Well, actually the thing about this theory is, and then I'll kind of ramble for like five minutes. I'm like, well, see you later. I'm going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we would all be so fun at parties, even though we don't really go to them. Like, that, that sounds like an awesome trait though. Oh, like, it's very, very fun. There's a, um, on the whiteboard out in our main room and there is uh, Sternberg's theory of love, uh, which I was explaining to my housemates just the other night. Um, <laughs> that is cool. That is cool. You sound like me in like so many ways. <laughs> yeah. I'm really relating to you tonight. I was, yeah. I went on a, I went on a date. I went on a date. Uh, uh, I've been going on a date with this person and they messaged me the day after and they're like, what did you do last night? And I was like, 
I uh, played video games. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I was up like really, really late explaining this theory of love to my housemates and we're having a really in-depth discussion about um, everything. Sternberg's theory of love, triangle of love. I would, I would, I would happily explain it to you uh, at some point outside of this webinar, or maybe we need, yeah, we need, we, we need to sit, yeah. So um, we need to sit down on a camp and like compare notes because yeah. I feel like the three of us will have very similar interests and we just yeah. don't get enough time to talk. Oh yeah, I'll bring my whiteboard to the next camp. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, uh, one just really quick note is I don't know what my support requirements are, so I don't feel like I can really advocate them for them that much. Um, well, my, I, I'm oh, sorry, go, I interrupted. Mm, okay. uh, go for it. I was just going to say, um, I've always found it really hard to like advocate for myself and speak up for like my needs. Um, mm. And I didn't really have to do that until I started uni last year. Mm. Really my mum was always my kind of advocate. Um, and so, you know, I got connected with um, the helping people. I don't know what you call them. What do you call them? academic support academic support yeah and got support through them and i had to like get my diagnoses mm. to like <laughs> give to them and they have to read them to make sure i was able to have the support and stuff so you know i guess previously i wouldn't have had the confidence to be like hey i actually do need a bit of help to make like i thought that i was it was embarrassing that i should just be on everyone else's level but now I understand that everyone's at a different level and, you know, someone like me, if I, I need to thrive, I can only thrive if I have that support. So, um, yeah, I think it takes time understanding yourself and understanding your autism to become comfortable enough to be like, yeah, yeah. I need to help. Yeah, definitely. Everyone, because everyone has needs regardless of whether you're autistic or not. Yeah, exactly. Um, everyone has like boundaries and stuff. And I think that you just kind of warm up to them the older you get. Mm. I was I was given the I can pitch the other day at a school meeting. It was like, hey, you know, when you support autistics, you support everyone. And like the someone on the admin team was like, hey, you said this thing. What do you mean? Like autistics and neurotypicals are different. Went, no, they're not. We all learn slightly differently. We all have different, you know, learning capabilities and stuff like that. When you make your school less sensorily confronting and when you are teaching in in autism friendly ways you're helping everyone there is no yeah. reason why as a school there should be a single kid failing and a lot of the time unless it's there they're not working like there's other stuff going on it's that they're failing to gel with how it's being taught so by teaching in these more friendly ways and by using like multi by using multi um learning type teaching stuff we're enabling everyone not just the autistic part of the population so mm -hmm. Exactly. Which is yeah. a long way of saying, I agree, Sam. <laughs> I, was, I was looking through my notebook because what you said about like that, if you make, it's like, if you make accommodations, making accommodations for the autistic kids doesn't just help the autistic kids. It helps every single person. It helps everyone learn heaps better by providing lots of different ways. And like by making it a sensory good environment, like, <sighs> Like, yeah, it, it's it's it's, it's friendly for everyone. Friendly. Everyone, it's like the if it's like the bare minimum for everyone. Anyway, there was someone told me this quote and it was really good. I wish I still had it. Um, but yeah, they Make, always yeah go go for it, dude. No, no, I, nothing. I, I was just gonna say yeah, it's funny. We always get the consistent bit of feedback that hey, I can presentations are really easy to follow and really easy to understand. It's like, I oh, know, yeah. right? It's almost like we're using, you know, multi-learning style friendly presentations and we're using audio and visual and light and we don't have a whole bunch of flashing LEDs and, you know, we, we cultivate our rooms to be just a certain way. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's simple stuff. A lot of simple kind of steps. Just like, yeah, just not making everything so loud and bright all the time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next question, 804. Okay, there's two more questions to go. Um, we've given them heaps of content. It's all good. Yeah. What What was the most useful thing in terms of embracing your autism? 100% uh, having an autistic community, being around other autistic people. That's the best thing ever. That's my answer. Okay. So am I go? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Drop yeah, mic. Um, you guys. <laughs> I, I, definitely, I definitely second that motion. Um, being around, ha like having a community and support network has definitely helped me embrace my autism. The other thing um, that I have done a lot is a lot of self-reflection. Um, the more I think and question why, who I am and why I am the way I am, I definitely start to understand more about my autism and accept it. And yeah. And also like, also the generic stuff, like um, watching documentaries or, <laughs> or um, going on www.autism.com. Yeah, things like that. And being like, or like reading blogs or like people's stories and having like aha moments, that mm. kind of stuff. It's just, it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing. Oh, but the question is, what is the most? It would be the network. <laughs> yeah. Do yeah. you uh, do you use um, social networks, IG, uh, I, I, e.g., um, Facebook groups for autistic people? I used to be like I used to be members of some and stuff, but I never would look at it. I just yeah. didn't. Um, but it is helpful for a lot of people, but I never really um, clinged on to anything. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Kyle? Did you ever find any online communities? Um, not as much, but because once again, you know, bullying, I, I'm unfortunately part of the, the generation where cyberbullying was a thing as well. I wasn't on social media until I was an adult. So I think yeah. I sort of missed the bus as far as like that being a helpful thing. I sort of, because I started working with ICAM when I was 19. Yeah. I've like, I, I sort of graduated school, hung around and did nothing for a little bit. And then, was surrounded by autistic role models and people that mm -hmm. would range from being like a couple of years older than me to like a couple of decades older than me. So mm -hmm. I had representation and, and people I could role model myself off because represent, I, you know, everyone keeps saying this, but it is super important. Representation is super important and role models. Being able to look at another person and say, I can be like that person oh, is yeah. so motivating. So empowering. And um, but, so yeah, bit of, as far as the question, a bit of column A, a bit of column B. So I can network is dope. <laughs> and like, I know we're pumping ourselves up a little bit, but being in a, in an environment with other autistics, it happens all the time. It's like, you just, we get each other. Yeah. Or if we, we don't, autistics are some of the most honest people, straightforward people I know. So if they don't get something, they'll tell you. Or if yeah. you, know, you say something that they find really confronting or really annoying, they will tell you. So communication is a breeze. Yeah. Oh yeah. But, uh, getting the other autistics is like, it's uh, it's very refreshing. It's very refreshing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to think. I don't have to think so hard. Yeah. I can be, um, express myself. And I don't have to have the such a hectic filter, which is exhausting. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as what Caitlin said, yeah, soul searching. Just sort of once again, you know, challenging my own prejudices and biases, like learning to not be so hard on myself which has been great for like everything, mental health, understanding autism, except self-acceptance, the whole shebang. Just, you know, learning not to see so much of myself as a negative, but it's sort of like, this is just the way I am. So let's just stop eating yourself alive and just move forward. Mm. Learn, to, learn to chill, learn to be okay with yourself. It's all going to be okay. It'll all work out. Little, little stuff like that, which everyone struggles with. But um, yeah, no, once I sort of got past that point of hating myself, and hating so much of what made me me, then life as an autistic became so much easier. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Self acceptance. Yeah, having that, having that, uh, I'm not alone, I'm not alone thing does wonders. It just does so much wonders for your self esteem, which this ties in very nicely to the last question, final question of the evening. Um, and then after that, we've answered the question, we'll have to do this. Yep. I'm down. Yep. <laughs> uh, I think I, I think that uh, what what you were just saying, Kyle, ties in very nicely. Oh yeah, the self acceptance thing. What is one piece of advice that you would give a person struggling to accept their diagnosis? Um, I think uh, seek out community, like we were just saying. Find communities where there are autistic people. Um, you can do it where there's people that are autistic, but maybe don't know they're autistic autistic or don't talk about like strange obscure interest groups you know there's pockets there's pockets of 
people where you're like, oh yeah, later, years down the track, maybe you're like, oh yeah, everyone was totally autistic. I mean, that's why we all got along so well. Um, and then there's some that are explicitly autism focused and you can do either, it's fine. Um, but I would also say, be curious about yourself. Like just be curious about who you are um, and just kind of observe yourself as like, you were just a vessel, you were just a soul in an autistic vessel. Um, and just like be interested in how that works and how that, when, what that's like and try and, you know, have good morals and try and live by your values and try and be a good person. Um, and you can just, uh, yeah, like you can explore that stuff and don't be so like hard on yourself and like try and fit in so much. Um, oh man, I wrote something. What did I write down? Blah, 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 blah. Sick human. You know, if you're a sick human, you will attract other sick humans. Totally. Um, sit with it and engage with other people um, who are similar. Engage with the people, find those good people out there and um, engage with them and stick with them um, and, and you'll be fine. You'll learn to accept yourself and you'll accept, when you accept your diagnosis, you can accept a lot more than just your autism diagnosis. You also find that you accept like heaps of other things. <laughs> there's, there's, I have, I don't think of my autism as a flaw um, but I have many flaws that I, uh, have learned to accept, um, along with kind of coming to terms with my autism, but it's just like, everyone's imperfect. Um, and, and I think learning that the autism wasn't tied to like, I've got lots of flaws that are probably unrelated to my autism diagnosis. Um, but Hey, I accept them now too. Yeah. Self-acceptance <laughs> is awesome. Okay. <laughs> I feel like that was a weird last message. I hope that's the last thing I'm going to say for the webinar, but that's fine. No, no, we're doing um, a summary at the end. <laughs> my one piece of advice, I have like a thousand pieces of advice, but I won't go through them all, um, is don't let the label define you. It doesn't, you know, it's just a part of who you are. It, does, it, isn't, it isn't who you are, you know? Um, yeah, I think when I, when I was when I was kind of going through my journey of understanding my autism, I definitely like latched onto it and thought that that was who I am and who I'm going to be. I didn't think about my values or my morals or how I treat people. It was just autism. Mm. Um, and also I have two other things I want to say. Um, just be patient. It takes time um, with anything in life, whether it's a diagnosis or if it's grief or if it's, um, climbing a tree like any <laughs> climbing a tree isn't a struggle though but <laughs> but just everything takes time and just like you said sit with it and be patient and you'll you know understand who you are another thing is um to push yourself so um i think often when you get told that you have a diagnosis you might it might it does stop some people from pushing themselves out of their comfort zone. They kind of restrict themselves quite a lot. So I'd say still engage, like you said, engage with people and push yourself and do things that you don't want to do. Like or having autism doesn't mean that you can't try things that seem unrealistic. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's not an excuse not to do things. Yeah. It, yeah, what, what you both said, just sort of live with it for a while, marinate with it. I was definitely mm -hmm. someone who, when I was younger, I hated having autism and I definitely wasn't the biggest fan of myself. So, but, and honestly, that all of that does with time and sort of, you know, everything, everything gets better the longer, longer you get to walk around with it. And autism stops being such a, like this, this big, heavy iron ball you're just dragging around. So, um, live with, Live with, live with it, live with stuff for a while. Just everything, everything changes with time. And, and I would also just add uh, real quick, sorry, Kelly, if you're about to just talk, I was going to say one thing, which is um, if you're not sure, if you're not sure like what you like and what you're interested in, what you're going to be into, oh my gosh, just try heaps of stuff. Just like try heaps of things, put yourself out of your comfort zone. I went rock climbing today and it was awesome. And there was heaps of cool people around there. I was walking around like, oh yeah, these people look like my tribe. I could do rock, uh, rock climbing if I wanted to, but I'm not because I already have other interests that I'm already engaged in. That was just, I like to try new things every now and again, test yourself, check your ego, see how you respond. And then afterwards you're like, mm, that was cool. Even if it wasn't, um, it's still was something good to reflect on. <laughs>